Greetings everyone. Okay friends, today I want to address a topic that I've covered before, um, probably on multiple occasions, but I haven't covered it from this angle before and I really want to address this topic because of some recent experiences. And these recent experiences is based upon discussions that I've had with people um, over YouTube on certain videos that have been posted where I've left comments. And I really want to make sure that this is understood because it has it is caused so much effect that many people today, even up to this moment in time, are still affected from it. Now the people that I've actually spoken to about this subject has really had a lot of biases based upon um, the existence of God, but more so after taking real and slow time just to see where they're coming from, I've come to understand that their real issue is about the morality of God or the character of God. And the doctrine that has triggered this, which is the doctrine that I want to now talk about in this video, is the subject of eternity in hell. Is this something that's actually true? And if it is true, why is this the case? Now this doctrine alone has not only affected atheism, but it's also affected Christians themselves. Christians because most of them really just accept Christ because of the fact that they don't want to burn in hell forever. When the Bible actually expresses that Jesus didn't come to save us from hell, but rather he came to save us from sin. And in fact, a very famous apologist, which I've personally learned a lot from, um, said something which was very unbiblical, which makes absolutely no sense. And I'm quite surprised that he actually said this. Notice what he says. Secondly, a punishment for sin against an eternal being may require an eternal punishment. Now, this is one of many other statements I've heard. But what's even more striking is not only um, hearing the beliefs of people, but I even watched this man right here. He was talking about his testimony of him being taken to hell, where he saw the wicked actually burn up. Their flesh was completely um, disintegrated, even all the way to their bones. And what's even more sinister is the fact that he saw their flesh grow back and then all started burning again. A continual process that was taking place for all eternity. People are, are, their flesh burns. They burn, they burn, they burn, and the flesh falls. And your bones get nice and toasty and black and gray. And when it's done, then the flame, the, your skin, your flesh starts growing back on you. And then the flames start again. Now that's just based upon the Christian mindset, but based upon the atheistic mindset, they just can't grasp the fact that people can be burnt for all eternity for doing something that they've done brief for a brief 70 years. In fact, as I was on YouTube, I was looking at this comment and I can completely understand where he's coming from. And it's like my heart actually went out to him in that sense. I want you to notice what he says. Okay, so God didn't want to create robots, but why have everlasting punishment? I love my daughter, I would discipline her for being naughty, but I would never allow her to be tortured for eternity. I would be considered evil for doing that, just because she didn't understand or figure it out in time, if eternal punishment is all true, it would be much better for us to be robots. I will gladly put my hand up and volunteer to be made into a robot if my destination is hell without escape anyone would. Now like I said I can completely understand where this guy is coming from because it makes total sense. It, it doesn't match with God's character and I'm sure if you really take time to stop and think about it you would agree too. And I guess when we also see the stream of testimonies from people who say there is a hell and that they have been there themselves one can only wonder is this actually true? Now from the outset I want to make it crystal clear from my personal understanding. From what I've studied in the Bible, I can conclude that this doctrine of eternity in hell is completely erroneous. And I personally believe that Satan has used this doctrine in such a way to make people just be afraid of God and just reject God totally. Now again, like I mentioned, after having several discussions with people on YouTube, atheists and Christians, I've come to see that one of the main main um, reasons why they believe that there is a hell is based upon Luke chapter 16. This is a very very popular teaching because Jesus himself also taught this according to their interpretation of the verses. But what we're going to do, we're going to see what this verse actually says, not this verse, this, this passage, and we're going to see if the Bible is really expressing what everybody is saying, what people are testifying of, and what atheism really hates about God. 
Let's now go into Luke chapter 16 and we're going to see exactly what it says. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and, li and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray ye therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he saith, Nay, Father Abraham, for if but, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now, simply just from this reading, I mean, how can I conclude that there's no place of eternal torment when we just read it? I mean, the verse is crystal clear that there is a hell and somebody is burning in torments, which means that that is as it is, right? Wrong. And as we go into these verses and understand what the verse is actually saying, we're going to see exactly why it is wrong to conclude that this is talking about eternity in hell. Notice as we go through the Bible just to break down these verses and understand it bit by bit to get the true interpretation. Now when we come to understand a topic of any sort, it's always best to see the full context. And the context starts from what was said at the beginning of the reading. Now I want us to check out these verses as we understand the context in what was said in Luke chapter 16. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 20 verse 9 which says this. Then began he to speak, to the people this parable a certain man planted a vineyard notice Luke 13 verse 6 he spake also this parable a certain man had a fig tree notice Luke 12 16 says and he spake a parable unto them saying the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully now Matthew chapter 21 verse 33 also expresses this by saying here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. Now based upon what we just read here, I'm sure that you can see a pattern being formed here. Every time Jesus said certain or a certain rich man, a certain householder, a certain such, in the context of a parable, they're always linked. So it's almost like Jesus is expressing a story or he's giving a story to relay his parable. And he uses the word certain. Now why is that important? Well look at Luke chapter 16 verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. Okay friends, so based upon Jesus' narration and the way he emphasizes his teachings and the way he uses certain language, you can see that what he's now expressing in Luke chapter 16 reading from verse 19 is a parable. Okay? Hope that makes sense. So now let's just spend a bit more time on this point. Based upon this understanding, the logical question would simply be this. What is a parable? Psalm chapter 78 verse 2 says this. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. 
So what you can notice now is that the Bible is likening parables to dark sayings. But what are dark sayings? Are they like dark evil sayings or something like that? Well let's see what the Bible says and let's allow the Bible to interpret itself. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 5 says this, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Now every time you see a colon at the end of the verse, it means that the next verse is going to express or explain what was previously said. So verse 6 is going to explain what was said in verse 5. Notice verse 6. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Now we just saw that dark sayings was found in Psalm chapter 78 verse 2. And based upon what we now understand in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 5 and 6, we understand that the parables are linked with understanding a lesson which requires interpretation which can only be understood by the wise. And so with this understanding we can also conclude that a parable is not a doctrine but rather the parable relays the lesson and the lesson is the doctrine all right i hope that also makes sense matthew chapter 13 verse 10 also says and the disciples came and said unto him why speakest thou unto them in parables and he answered and said unto them because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it is not given. Verse 13 says, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Now that makes sense based upon why the parables are called dark sayings, because unless you, it's like if you don't understand, you're going to be in darkness. Now before we continue, notice how Ezekiel puts it in Ezekiel chapter 17 verse 2. Son of man, Put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. So, so far friends, what we can conclude is that if you're concluding that a parable is a doctrine, you prove that you're not wise. Why? Because what we've seen here, when Jesus expressed a parable, it wasn't a doctrine, but rather it was a lesson to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so friends, with this understanding, the question that must be asked is this. In Luke chapter 16, what is this parable actually talking about? Is it talking about somebody burning in hell for eternity? Was that the lesson? Well, I want to just summarize it for just, just for time's sake. I want to summarize what Luke chapter 16 verse 19 to 31 is actually expressing. Now, the parable in Luke chapter 16, from my understanding, it reminds me of um, the rich young ruler and also the parable of the woman who gave everything she had in the temple while there are many people who are rich given many, many coins into the temple. But this woman gave all she had. Now with the rich young ruler, he had goods, but he sought to seek his own salvation without regards for those who were suffering around him. But the, the, the man in Luke chapter 16, the rich man, he held this kind of position, you could say. He had a status. He, he was regarded in himself as somebody great because he was rich and he had Abraham as his bloodline, you could say. But the poor man ended up receiving salvation because even though he was poor, he still committed his life to God, even in his poor condition. And that reminds me of the parable of the woman who gave all that she had. Though she was poor, she committed her life to God. And Jesus Christ said to, about that woman that she gave more than all the rich people had given. And so what that teaches essentially for us today is that we may think that because we... Um, have more truth than someone else because we wear the best clothes or because we do this that and the other we think that because of that we are better than everybody else and the root of that kind of mindset is based upon confidence in self but the bible has expressed many times that those who have confidence or who uplift themselves will be abased in other words your confidence in your own self and in your own possessions in your own um, whatever's around you which you kind of class yourself as being great amongst yourself that is the cause of your own downfall and I like the way that Jesus expresses this in Matthew chapter 21 because it makes us realize that wow actually there's people that's going to go ahead of us which we may think that will never end up in heaven and that's because of our own self-confidence notice what Jesus says Jesus saith unto them verily I say unto you that the publicans and the 
harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Verse 32 says, For John came, John the Baptist, John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards, that ye might believe him. Paul also expresses this even more by saying this in Romans chapter 12 verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Okay friends, so I hope that that's made very clear sense. Confidence in yourself, confidence in where you came from, and confidence in what you have could be the downfall if you think that these are the things that, or the means that will make sure or guarantee your status in heaven. God is looking on the heart rather than the outward. But now here's a question. Why would Jesus use such a parable if it wasn't true? Why would he express about torments in hell if that, that, that doctrine is completely erroneous? Well, based upon Jesus, he's very, very wise when it comes to engaging with people and uh, making sure that they understand the lesson while also you know, showing what's important to say at that moment in time. Now, there's two examples that I want to give. One is actually from a Sadducee who gave a parable to Jesus and another example is when God actually demonstrated an example to Peter for him to understand as well. I want you to notice what um, these lessons actually bring about so that we can understand it in the clarity. Now I want to start with the Sadducee. Notice what he says. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and they asked him, saying... Now, before we continue, I want you to notice this very clear point, that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Okay, now let's continue. Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto her brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed. And the third likewise. And the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. Verse 23 is the key, it says, In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall be of them? For the seven had her to wife. Now, wait a minute. He didn't believe in the resurrection, but for some reason he's using the resurrection in his parable to Jesus. Now, why was the Sadducee doing that? Because we saw clearly that he didn't believe in the resurrection. Well, what he was doing is he was using the common belief that Jesus believed, and he knew that if he wanted to relay his message, he had to kind of do things in a way in order for him to understand what he was saying. It didn't mean that he believed the resurrection, but he was using that to his advantage so that he can bring out his own agenda whatever that agenda was. Okay friends, so I, I'm sure you can see that principle. I hope you can see it. Um, if it doesn't make sense, please leave a comment in the description. I'll probably write it up. But I want to use um, Acts chapter 10 to um, further illustrate the point. Now this is God using a principle or using a circumstance towards Peter. Notice this. Acts chapter 10 verse 9 says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth Hour. Now notice this in verse 10. This is very important to hold on to or to understand this detail. It says, And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Now notice after understanding that Peter was very hungry, notice how God uses some principles here. Verse 11 says, And saw heaven open. Now he's in, he's in a trance right now, and he says, And he saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending upon him, as it had been a great um, sheet knit at, at the four corners, and let down to the earth. Verse 12 says, Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. 
Verse 15 says, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God have cleansed, that call not thou common. Now friends, was God advocating that Peter should eat unclean foods? No. You see, the same way that the Sadducee used um, the belief at that time, or the, the common belief, for his advantage, you can still see the same principle that God is using a circumstance to bring out an overall lesson. And that circumstance or situation was the fact that Peter was very hungry. Now this is very important to understand, especially for people who say that they've had experiences where they've been taken to hell or taken to heaven or they've seen hell for themselves in visions or whatever the case may be. This is what, what, what you can learn from this principle here in this um, in this passage in Acts chapter 10. See, instead of people running to say there is a hell, there is um, people burning there forever because I've seen it, instead they should have done what Peter did here. Peter went back to the Bible. He knew that in Leviticus that the unclean animals were in the um, in the sheet that God brought down. Therefore, he actually used the scripture on God himself, you could say. He, he said, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. I'm not going to eat that. So instead of Peter saying, oh, well, God's given me a vision that I can eat anything I want now. So I can eat things like pork, uh, lobster, prawns, crabs, um, all these unclean foods. Instead of running to that conclusion, what did he conclude using the word of God? Notice. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were together. And he said unto them, Ye know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath shown me that I should not call any man common. Or unclean. Friends, Peter didn't just run and say, I can eat whatever I wanted. He stopped and said, is this of God or is this not? And if it is of God, what is he actually trying to tell me? This is what those who have um, said that they've been in hell should have actually done. So friends, with all that understanding, we can now take these two principles and bring it here into Luke chapter 16 and see why did Jesus actually use that example in the parable of Luke chapter 16. Well, if you notice the pattern of events of how Jesus interpreted things, you can see that Jesus was using the common falsehood in that time to relay a principle which he wanted to bring out at that time, which was necessary to talk about at that time. Almost like Jesus was saying once upon a time, there was a rich man and Lazarus and continue in the parable. Now I want to read this quote. This quote is taken from the book Christ Object Lessons and this also emphasizes what I've concluded in the Bible. So notice what this quote says and you're going to see exactly how everything ties together because of the principles that we've seen in the word of God, how God relates things in the way in which he sees fit. Notice what it says. In this parable, Christ was meeting the people on their own ground. The doctrine of conscious state of existence between death and the resurrection was held by many of those who were listening to Christ's words. The Saviour knew of their ideas and he framed his parable as to so inculcate important truths through these preconceived opinions. He held up before his hearers a mirror wherein they might see themselves in their true relation to God. He used a prevailing opinion to convey the idea he wished to make prominent to all. That no man is valued for his possessions for all he has belongs to him only as lent by the Lord. Okay friends, I believe that's made everything clear. Luke chapter 16 is not a parable or a doctrine about eternity in hell. Jesus was using the common mindset of people, the opinions of what they believed at that time, to relay the message that he believed was important to express at that time, just so that they can understand based upon their preconceived ideas. Okay, I hope that makes sense. But we can rest assured that Luke chapter 16 is not talking about eternity in hell. It is talking about those who express that they are saved because of their status or how they perceive themselves to be because of where they came from or what they have.
Now friends, regarding the actual topic of hell, I know there's a lot to cover and I won't be able to cover it in this video. I have, I've also uploaded a video from uh, the ministry Amazing Facts and this animation is absolutely fantastic. I mean, it perfectly portrays the teaching of hell in the biblical sense and not in the false sense. And I strongly believe that you will really enjoy this video. Okay, This video is going to be in the description box below, so please have a look at it when you get the opportunity. But for now friends, um, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I pray that this has made sense. If you, um, I don't know, whoever's watching this, if you had this thought that God burns people for all eternity, it's completely erroneous, especially from the verse that people are trying to use in Luke chapter 16. But I also pray and hope that this has caused some liberation to people who may think or feel that I'm going to burn in hell for eternity, even though you want to accept God, but you have this fear that this is that you know is, is this something that's actually true and this has caused you to think is god actually loving so anyway i really pray that this has liberated you from this because friends the doctrine of eternal torment is not biblical okay friends i want to thank you once again um i want to end this video now because it's been probably too long but um i pray that this has made sense and friends if you have any questions or comments please leave it in the comments box below because i know this is a very big subject so just leave your comments and we can um, discuss we can reason together and by god's grace we'll all come to the point of truth because it is only the truth that will set us free all right thank you once again god bless you all and i will see you in the next video Take care. Bye for now.